Hello there, hidden gem movie lovers. Welcome to Cinema Nostalgica, where we dive into the world of forgotten nostalgic cinema. I am your host, Veronica, and today we're going to take a trip down memory lane to explore the 2001 horror thriller film, Valentine. So grab your popcorn, hit that subscribe button, and let's get started. Released in 2001, Valentine is a slasher film directed by Jamie Blanks. It's a chilling tale that mixes teenage angst with a sinister plot that unfolds during the Valentine's Day season. And right off the bat, just with the cast alone, we are talking Y2K 2000's Hollywood royalty. The cast stars Denise Richards from Wild Things, David Boreanaz, I know I'm saying that wrong, but he is the heartthrob on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We have Marley Shelton and Katherine Heagle. So like I said, the cast did not disappoint and the acting was actually really good. I didn't find this movie cheesy or hard to watch. Honestly, I cringe when I see really bad acting, but you know, Y2K 90s gold, the acting was superb. So before we dive in, this video is going to be broken down into several parts. We'll discuss the plot summary, character dynamics, and visual appeal. In the visual appeal category, we're going to be talking about the fashion and style, the cinematography, set design and location, Y2K technology references, the music and soundtrack, and also just the overall Y2K aesthetics, which makes this movie such a great example of a time capsule during that time. And last but not least, we will be going over the plot twist at the end, which again, I did not know it was such a crazy plot twist until I rewatched it recently for this video. So without further ado, let's kick off with the plot summary. The film begins with a traumatic incident at a middle school dance where a socially awkward boy named Jeremy Melton is humiliated and rejected by several girls. The girls who are our main characters, we have Kate Davis, Paige Prescott, Dorothy Wheeler, Lily Voint, and Shelley Fisher. Oh, and I don't think I mentioned this before, but there will be spoilers because technically this is a deep dive video. So if you have not seen Valentine, please go watch it and then click back so we can do the deep dive together. Okay, so where were we? Yes, Jeremy Milton is humiliated because he's asking all of these girls if they want to have a dance with him and Dorothy Wheeler is the only one who says yes. Dorothy Wheeler is going through her own self-esteem issues, so when Jeremy Milton asks her to dance, she actually really likes the attention and they actually end up making out underneath the bleachers. And it is this very scene that causes the events of the whole entire movie. A group of bullies find the two making out and they start making fun of them and Dorothy trying to go into self-protective mode tells the bullies that Jeremy is a pervert and was actually coming on to her and forcing her to kiss him. It's at this moment that the boys pour punch all over Jeremy Milton very much like Carrie style, drags him out of the bleachers, strip him in front of his classmates, and physically beat him up in front of everyone. It is also during this scene that we get our first glimpse of the killer's mask, which is the Valentine's Day Cupid mask. Okay, so I'm actually going to put a pin in it right now because we need to discuss. So again, this video is for those who have watched Valentine's and is looking for a deep dive. So we all know what happens during this movie. And we all know who the assailant is and who the victims are. And my question is, why didn't Jeremy Melton go after the guys? Why did he go after the girls? Now, we're going to talk about the plot twist later, but we all kind of know that Jeremy Melton is the main assailant here. So why didn't he go after the guys who publicly humiliated the him and beat him up in front of the entire class? I mean, it's definitely giving woman hater vibes for him to be going after the women who just rejected him for dancing. 
And yes, Dorothy definitely has a big part to play. But again, why didn't he go after the guys? I don't know. Food for thought. I just thought about this when I was rewatching this movie for like the 10th time. Anyways, moving on, years later, the group of friends who are now adults starts receiving threatening Valentine's Day cards and becomes the target of a mysterious killer who is wearing that Cupid mask that we saw at the dance. The murders escalate and it is revealed that the killer is seeking revenge for the past wrongs that were suffered by Jeremy Melton. Now that the plot is out of the way, let's go on to looking deeper inside of the lives and the stereotypical tropes of these four girls. We have Kate, who is the nice, popular girl next door. She's actually dating a guy named Adam. We have Paige, who is played by Denise Richards. She is the seductress type. Then we have Lily, who is the fun, eclectic girl. And then we have Dorothy. Dorothy is the one who is technically overweight in middle school and has kind of turned into a mean girl. Now let's just look at the cast themselves. Now the cast is absolutely beautiful. The actresses, Catherine Hegel, Jessica Coffiel, Dennis Richards, Marley Shelton, and Jessica Capshaw, they are all so beautiful and attractive in their own way. And like I mentioned before, the emotions and their personalities showed their depths in their roles. And yes, we will go over the cliched pretty girls in horror movie stereotype trope, but I would say the characters in Valentine's aren't your typical horror movie blonde bombshell stereotypes. Even though I actually do think they're all blonde, except for Denise Richards. <laughs> But each friend has their own secrets, adding layers of complexity to the narrative. As the tension builds, so does the suspicion among the group, creating an atmosphere of paranoia and fear. So traditionally, horror films have often portrayed the attractive and popular girl as a stereotypical victim or just an overall shallow character. But Valentine plays with these conventions. In the film, the pretty girls are not merely one-dimensional figures. They each have their own personalities, flaws, secrets, defying the cliched expectations that's often associated with this trope. These characters aren't just there to fulfill the role of the victim. Instead, they are complex individuals with depth. For example, and I'm just going to briefly discuss this, but Paige the character played by Denise Richards. She is labeled the seductress, and as we all know, Denise Richards does usually play these type of roles. But with Paige, although she is kind of that seductress style, she's actually single and a hopeless romantic. We see her at blind dates trying to find a date. It is known that she is single, and yeah, maybe she's had a little bit of a naughty past, but in the movie, she actually turns down a lot of guys and actually seems really sweet when she's talking about Jeremy Melton and actually feels regret for the way that she treated him. As the plot unfolds and a mysterious killer targets the group, the pretty girls become more than just potential victims. The departure from the typical slasher movie formula provides a refreshing take on the pretty girl trope, giving the characters agency and contributing to the overall mystery and intrigue of the film. Okay, now let's go over the visual appeal. Starting off with the fashion, the characters in Valentine are clad in quintessential Y2K fashion. The film showcases the trends of the time, including low-rise jeans, chunky heels, and crop tops. They also give out this really sleek kind of model off duty vibe when you see them in just a white tee leather jacket blue jeans with some black boots the wardrobe of the characters are such a nod to the fashion statements that divine the turn of the century giving the movie a really distinct visual flair the costume design for the film was done by denise wingate and wingate is a seasoned costume designer she's worked on various films and projects including twilight and stranger things After doing more research on Denise Wingate, I found that she was also the costume designer on Melrose Place, Cruel Intentions, She's All That, and The Sweetest Thing. She landed Melrose Place at the age of 26, and Cruel Intentions was only her second feature. 
It makes so much sense that Denise would also work on this incredibly stylish film. And it seems like we have her to thank for these iconic It Girl late 1990s, early 2000s looks. The cinematography of Valentine is super moody but extra stylish. The Valentine's Day setting adds an extra layer of tension, blending themes of love, portrayal, and revenge. And the film skillfully blends together suspenseful scenes with Valentine's Day aesthetics, creating a visually engaging experience for the audience. And because it captures that Y2K essence so well, it just serves as a visual time capsule of the culture of that time. The set design of the film was done by Peter Grundy and the best way that I can describe this aesthetic is like an episode out of Sex in the City. If you could just imagine 2000s New York City nightclub, I don't know why but this video just captures that essence. So because this is a horror slasher film, we will expect the atmosphere to be dark and suspenseful. The use of shadows, lighting, and camera angles contributes to the film overall sense of mystery and horror. And this very distinctive visual style does align with the conventions of that early 2000s horror genre, offering a mix of traditional technique with a contemporary edge. The dark and moody atmosphere also is combined with elements of being really sleek and stylish but it all is catered to the moments of tension and suspense the scenes are a lot more grounded though in more like a real world setting emphasizing on the impact of past events on the characters lives two of my favorite settings in the film is the art gallery which again just looks like it was plucked right out of a nightclub in new york city as seen on sex in the city and also the apartments of Paige and Lily. Their apartment was so Y2K. You see those elements of chrome with pops of green and purple and like those wooden really tall cats by the door. It is just so was essential to the trends that were happening during that time. Valentine also incorporates technology of the era or I guess the lack thereof including early cell phones, instant messages, CD players, and these elements not only just ground the film in its time, but it also adds suspense as the characters grapple with evolving communication methods. One of the best examples of this is when Paige and Lily are in their apartment and Lily requested a dating tape from a guy. So this is way before Tinder, obviously, way before even DVDs was mainstream and especially before the internet really blew up and became mainstream. And I find it so funny how Kate is trying to look up Jeremy Melton on some website called Interlinked. It's like some rendition of Facebook. I just think it's so funny to see these major websites, which are just exploded and contributing to our everyday lives, just did not exist back then. And it wasn't even that long ago. Moving on to the music and soundtrack, the tracks featured in the film is definitely hidden gems of themselves. And a lot of the scores are instrumental, but it does serve as a sonic backdrop to the narrative. And the music definitely adds a layer of nostalgia and enhances the film's connection to Y2K culture. There's even a song by Linkin Park. If you listen really carefully, it's played during the scene where Dorothy is upset at her own Valentine's Day party. And at the very end of the film, after the iconic plot twist, the song Breed by Snake River Conspiracy plays at the ending credits. And it is just such a sinister but sleek and modern take on the events that just took place. And it just adds this tone of mystery and suspense, but in the Y2K lens. Let's look into the Y2K vibe a little bit more because it really does permeate throughout the film. As we know, Y2K culture is characterized by the fascination of the future and a blend of technology and fashion, and Valentine really does tap into this aesthetic, still holding true though to the 90s aesthetic as well. Again, this movie was just in 2001, so there is still very much a heavy tone on 90s, 90s sleek modernism that is shown throughout the film with its sleek visuals, polished surfaces, and there's even like a glossy sheen that's very emblematic of the time and of 
movies that were produced during the late 90s, early 2000s. Upon watching this movie for the first 10 times, I thought that there was only one plot twist to the end of this movie. So just a quick summary, at the very end of the scene, we see Dorothy as the killer and Adam Carr shoots her to protect Kate. This is the first part of the plot twist. The second twist is we see Adam dripping nose blood with sinister music in the backdrop, just like what the killer has been doing throughout the film. So we are inclined to believe that he has somehow got Dorothy into the mask and framed her as the killer. So that was my observation. After watching this movie like 10 plus times, I never questioned the ending. I always thought that was true. But upon my last viewing of the film, with an analytical eye trying to prepare for this video, there is a lot more to unpack in this last scene and I have a few questions. Observation number one, when Dorothy is attacking Kate or when she falls over Kate and they both tumble down the stairs, why didn't Dorothy scream or say something or take off the mask? Now I get it, the interaction between her and Kate was really quick, but her mouth wasn't duct, duct taped or anything. And as we can see after the tumble, there is a dead silence where no one is moving. And then all of a sudden, Dorothy shoots up really quick. It's definitely a nod to Scream and how there are rules to surviving a horror film. One of those rules or one of the things that always happens is that the killer is never dead when, when a tumble like that happens. You have to kill them twice. And the way that Dorothy stood up so quickly, I mean, it was definitely like a stereotypical murderer in a slasher film. But either way, I'm just saying, if she stood up so quickly, why didn't Dorothy talk to Kate or scream to Kate or make a noise or being like, hey, Kate, it's me, Dorothy. What was going on there? And also, if we are going with the original plot twist that I described earlier, we would think that Adam is framing Dorothy. But if that's the case, then how did he get her to not only wear the mask, but also change her outfit? She is now dressed in all black with the killer boots the whole nine yards. So what was going on there and why was he able to get her to not only wear the mask, but also change the outfit? And another clue that debunks my original theory that again, Adam is framing Dorothy is the bruise on her face. Remember in the previous scenes when that crazy ex-girlfriend of Dorothy's scammer boyfriend, when she was attacked, she hit the killer in the face with a pool stick. And you would think that the killer will have some wounds. Well, if you look back, Adam Carr does not have any wounds on his face, but Dorothy has a black eye on that same side that she would have gotten hit with the pool stick so my original theory is completely debunked now based on this evidence i want to introduce the next theory or the next plot twist which is dorothy was she actually involved is she actually the killer throughout the film we see that dorothy harbors some deep-seated resentment against her friends from her childhood and it seems like this is stemming from feelings of abandonment and betrayal. Even from the first scene of the dance, we see that all of the girls are kind of in their own clique, surrounded by each other, but Dorothy is sitting by herself on top of the bleachers. Throughout the film, we saw that Dorothy had some really deep issues regarding her self-esteem, her relationships, and just always comparing herself to her friends. It seems like she was really jealous of her friends and that jealousy stemmed from their relationships back in grade school. We really see her self-esteem issues when it comes to her boyfriend that she has at the time. And when the girls brought up to her like, hey, maybe things are moving too fast with this guy, she blew it completely out of proportion and thought the girls were jealous and just didn't want to see her happy. He is clearly just using her for money and she's kind of being a yes woman to him, letting him stay with her when they've only known each other for a month and then giving him a Rolex for Valentine's Day when he didn't even get her anything. 
So knowing this about Dorothy, it really does add a psychological layer to the story, which emphasizes the long-lasting impact of childhood trauma and the unexpected sources of vengeful acts. So with this being said, there is motive. There is a lot of motive of why Dorothy would be the killer, which I've never really seen before. So this brings me to my next theory. Was Dorothy working with Adam or Jeremy Melton this whole time? Is she and Jeremy Melton partners in crime? We know from the dance that she actually liked him in the past, but then she had to lie about it to save herself from public humiliation. Did she somehow, some way reconnect with him and together they plotted against the friend group? I mean, we simply could not ignore the nosebleed and the sinister music that was implied at the very end of the film. I do truly believe that Adam Carr is Jeremy Melton. But with that being said, that brings us to the next theory. Is Adam Carr innocent and is he just not Jeremy Melton? Does this poor guy Adam just suffer from nosebleeds and because he just shot someone is in shock and is physically and emotionally distressed? Going back to the final scene, Adam's nose begins to bleed and the nosebleed is a cinematic device used to suggest that Adam is not entirely unaffected by the traumatic events and deception that just unfolded. We also know that he is kind of drunk at the time based on his story of being a recovering alcoholic or just has an issue with drinking in itself. But typically in storytelling, a nosebleed can symbolize stress, tension, or just an emotional release. So in this case, Adam's nosebleed may be an indication of the psychological toll that that situation just took on him. Or we have our next theory, which Adam Carr is Jeremy Melton, but he wasn't involved in the murders. And Dorothy framed Jeremy. And when I say that Dorothy framed Jeremy, I mean throughout the entire film, she might have been hinting that it was him or again framing him by signing JM on all of the Valentine's Day cards. If you think about it, all we have from Jeremy is that JM signature and Dorothy could have easily wrote that herself. And the only other evidence that seems that Adam is connected to the murders is after Kate told him about her creepy neighbor, the neighbor is then suddenly killed by Cupid. So that would signify that he's trying to protect Kate. Another clue that Adam is actually Jeremy Melton or just the Cupid murderer is that the IOU TLC note is found near Detective Vaughn's body in the pond outside of the mansion where the Valentine's Day party takes place. So in summary, we have a lot going on and there is a lot to decipher and there's also a lot up to interpretation after viewing the scene. So is Adam Carr the killer and he framed Dorothy? Or is Dorothy the killer and she just wrote JM on all of the Valentine's Day cards trying to set up the Jeremy Melton story? Or is Adam Carr actually Jeremy Melton and he and Dorothy were in cahoots together? Or is Adam Jeremy Melton but he wasn't involved with the murders? I am really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments and what you think the true plot twist was. Again, like I stated before, there is just something so unique about this quote-unquote slasher film. It's the touch of mystery, the stylistic charm of the cinematography, the fashion, the cast, the good-looking people, the actually surprisingly good acting, and the plot twist at the end would just keep you guessing. Like, there is no resolve. We do not know what's going on. And I think that's one of the aspects that makes this film so intriguing. I don't know why, but I am always just left with this unsettling feeling about the film that makes me want to just keep rewatching it. And well, there you go. And there you have it. Thank you so much for watching this deep dive on the 2001 film Valentine. And again, I really hope that you've watched it before watching this video. And please let me know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more content regarding nostalgic cinema and hidden gem movies. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, I'll see you soon.